Study of an Orange. The dark girl with the short brown hair decides to draw an orange. There are colored chalks and colored paper, and Sister Hornick says everyone may draw what they wish. The dark girl thinks that the teacher is tired of teaching, as she often is by this time in the afternoon, and today was an especially hard day. She was forced to assign several pages of dictionary copying to Brian Dillenberger and Brian Prescott, the two Brians in the class, who spent their math time pretending that Jennifer Hart was a snapping turtle and teased her, dangling pencils or bits of broken crayon in front of the fat girl's mouth until she buried her head in her hands and sobbed. The dark girl observed all of this from her desk in a back corner of the classroom. She thinks the two brides are horrible and forgives the teacher for being tired. She feels sorry for Jennifer Hart, who actually sat with her today at lunch and offered her half a brush lighter sandwich and an orange in exchange for her peanut butter and jelly. The dark girl didn't care much for the brunch wagger. She didn't like the smell of the meat or the way it melted on her tongue. She threw most of the sandwich away, but kept the orange, which she now pulls from the pocket of her winter coat. Around the room, she sees the other girls designing clothing, bell-bottom blue jeans, striped turtleneck sweaters, crinkled vinyl miniskirts, and multicolored suede shoes. The boys are drawing cars they hope to own one day. Corvettes and Camaros. Some secretly sketch characters memorized from Mad Magazine, hiding their drawings beneath crooked arms, as Mad Magazines are not allowed in the fifth grade. One of the Bryans has very badly drawn a torso of a woman, bikini clad, pencil point nipples showing through above the curvy W. He's made to indicate a breast line. He's holding it behind the back of his chair with his left hand while continuing to draw with his right. A muffled giggle spreads among the corvetting Camaro drawers sitting behind him. The dark girl looks up but does not giggle. She glances over at the teacher to see if another dictionary page will be assigned, but sees her attending only to the stack of papers on her desk busy clinging to the end of her red pencil as it flies over essays on the Spirit Lake Massacre and its importance on Iowa State history. The girl sets the orange on her desk. It is a simple thing, just a circle really, so she thinks she can manage it. The torso embarrasses her and she tries to shut out the snickering. She doesn't draw attention to herself as there is nothing magnificent about attempting to draw an orange, nor is it risky enough to attract ridicule. The first curve of the orange chalk shimmers over the gray paper in a way that it doesn't on white, and she is surprised. She takes a breath and looks up briefly to make sure no one is looking back at her corner. She finishes the circle. But before filling it in, she notices the orange color changes over the surface of the fruit and wonders how to recreate the effect in her drawing. She tries adding gray on the side that should be darker, but blended with orange, it becomes slightly green and she's unhappy. She adds a little blue to the gray and this makes it worse. She bites her bottom lip in frustration and turns the paper over, deciding this time to work on the brighter side of the orange first. To a swatch of orange chalk, she adds splashes of yellow and white, and then with a tissue from her desk, she blends the colors, making curving strokes, as she's seen done on educational televisions, picture perfect with Clarice. Clarice says this is the key to making things look three-dimensional. Just follow the form as if you were actually drawing on the surface of the object itself. The girl can see that it's better and is excited to start another drawing. But the class is starting to squirm, pointing out to the teacher that it is five to three and time to clean up. So she sighs, knowing that she must wait to try again. She looks around hesitantly at the other drawings in the room, the halter tops and the hip huggers, the Camaros and Corvettes, 
They are flat and bound to their papers, while her orange is round like a ball. This difference makes the girl feel just a little bit older, and after signing her name, Espy, to the bottom of her drawing, she slips a few chalks along with the orange into her pocket. The bus lets Espy off only two blocks from her home, but she takes a longer route so she can pass by the vacant lot on the top of the hill. There is a buckeye tree there. The girls in her class collect buckeyes and trade them at recess. When Anne Marie Sherwood got three from Lyndall Schwartz in exchange for a mood ring, she let Espy hold one. It was cold and smooth, the color of Espy's hair. Espy ran her thumb several times over the eye that held the good luck inside. It was a perfect buckeye. But there, was, but there are none like it here. Only a few broken shells embedded in icy footprints. She pulls her orange out of her pocket and wonders about the tree it came from. Orange trees don't lose their leaves. Espy knows this. Her mother told her, there is a picture of an orange tree in Espy's book of fairy tales from around the world. Espy loves to look at the picture of the orange tree and wonders about the exotic places where such trees grow. Spain, Florida, California. Espy was born in California, but doesn't remember it much. She certainly doesn't remember orange trees. Her mother, who lived all her life there until Espy was four, tells Espy it's not exotic as all that, but Espy thinks she would like one day to live where orange trees grow. When she gets home, she pushes her way through the gate with some difficulty as it is partially blocked by snow. She squeezes through and walks around to the back where she can open the door with a key from around her neck. She enters cautiously, checking first the kitchen room closet, the, clo the coat closet in the hall, the bathroom, the two bedrooms with their closets. It is a ritual she always performs, saying Hail Mary's all the while. When it is clear to her there is no one in the house, she takes a deep breath and begins to relax. She doesn't check the basement. It's too scary. She sets a chair in front of the basement door, believing that the noise it would make if anyone tried to break through would give her sufficient time to escape. This has been Espy's routine for the past month. Now that she's turned 11 and her mother has switched to a day job, a decision has been made that she can come home alone after school instead of spending the afternoons with, with Mrs. Hardigal next door, who always preferred cats to children. Espy's mother won't be home after five, and they will cook dinner together. She doesn't have much homework, so she thinks she has time to give to her orange. She pulls it out of her coat pocket, along with the chalks, and sets them on the vinyl lace tablecloth, then removes her coat and drapes it over the back of a chair. She turns on the overhead light and sees many shadows, and then turns it off again and sees just one, stretched out, opposite the sun, now low in the kitchen window. She rips a paper grocery bag in half, and recreates the orange there, with its shadow long and stretched. Then she turns the overhead light back on and draws a second orange below the first. This orange sits in the center of a group of mismatched flower petals formed by its own shadows pulled this way and that. Espy does several more drawings before the wooden clock on the wall chimes and interrupts her. Her mother will be home soon, and she decides to surprise her. She sticks the drawings up on the refrigerator with magnets and then sweeps the floor and sets the table for two. Her mother will be happy to come home and see what a help her daughter has become. Espy's mother works at the grocery store lunch counter, making up milkshakes and pots of soup. On the days that Espy's father will be home for dinner, her mother brings home special things sticky sweet rolls, barbecue pork ribs, beer, ham for sandwiches, shoestring potatoes. 
But tonight he's still in his truck, maybe crossing Utah, maybe Nevada, as he doesn't know for certain. She just knows that crossing the country takes a very long time. He's not her real father, but when Espy asks about her real father, her mother says it doesn't matter anymore, and it doesn't. Not really. She calls this father daddy, and sometimes he brings her things from truck stops and gas stations, foot-long bubble gums, a rabbit foot keychain, a flip book that, when she flips the pages fast enough, makes a little cat dance with a balloon until the balloon explodes, knocking him over backwards. Then she can watch the bump grow out of his head through the center of the circle of dangling stars. And it is he, not her real father, who saves her at night when she has the dream about the runaway car. In the dream, Espy is always at the steering wheel, but her foot can't reach the brake pedal. She is speeding down the steep blacktop road away from her house over potholes, past the Barnhart's yard with its Dutch windmill and pink flamingos, past the horsemen's with the old wagon wheel and she likes, that she likes to climb. There's nothing she can do but scream and cry at this car gone out of control. But then she sees him running in the rearview mirror, the sleeves of his blue trucker shirt rolled up with bends stitched over the pocket in red those massive arms that wrap themselves around her mother after he's gone too long, pumping back and forth at his sides. He whips past the car and pushes his arms forward in front of it. Espy sees the lily tattoo with her mother's name below it pulsing on his forearm, and with no more effort than it takes him to push a lawnmower or sweep Espy off the ground, he stopped the car and saved her from toppling off the edge of the world, which is where the dream always ends. Esperanza, come help me, her mother calls from the back door. Espy sweeps the chalks quickly back into her coat pocket, leaving the table clean, and then rushes to the back door to help her mother, who is struggling with two bags of groceries. Look, Mama, I've been drawing. She points to the refrigerator after setting one of the bags down on the counter. Yes, Miha, it's beautiful. Her mother smiles. Now her mother is speaking to her in English as they unpack the groceries together, asking her how her day was, who she played with. Espy is answering, but she's not listening. She's trying to remember the words or phrases in Spanish. She sees her grandmother as she was when she was still alive patting out tortillas and stirring sugar into the coffee. She sees her scold the cat when he reaches with his front paws to dig in the big tub of masa on the floor at her side. She can smell the coffee and the cinnamon, feel the warmth of a fresh tortilla in her hand, but she can't hear the words. Yes, Mama, we had the spelling test today, and no, Mama, it wasn't hard. She answers her mother's questions, but her mind is stretching back in time, looking for the translation. But then the scene changes, and her grandmother is gone. Espy sees herself much smaller, alone in her bed and scared. She hears a man's voice, loud noises, fighting, the sound of her mother crying. There's a crash against the wall, and then there is silence. Espy stops trying to remember. This is how it always is when Espy tries to remember Spanish. She stops trying to remember the words just as she is about to remember something much worse. She hands the grocery bag she has folded to her mother and smiles, pretending that she has never drifted off. Her mother takes the bag and smiles back. Her mother fills a pot with water and puts it on the stove to boil while Espy unwraps a loaf of bread and puts it on the cutting board. Do you have homework, Esperanza? Her mother asks. Just a little. Why don't you do it now while I finish the spaghetti? Espy hands her mother the bread knife and goes down the hall to her room. She pulls the social studies book out of her book bag and curls up on her bed opens up to a section she knows already. An entire village of Iowa Indians shot to death while watching a horse race. 
leaving behind few survivors, their name, and this cold, quiet place where oranges don't grow. She lets her book drop closed. She wonders why she and her mother are here, why they left California and sunshine behind, why they stopped speaking Spanish. She's afraid to ask her mother. If she does, Espy thinks her mother will tell her that it's because her abuelita died and no one needs to speak Spanish anymore. But Espy knows that's not the whole story. Ben is part of the story. Her mother does not even use the word mija when he is around. Espy remembers record albums when they first moved in here with Ben. While she ironed or did the dishes, her mother would play them, singing along to Pedro Infante and Javier Solis. But one day, Ben came home while the music is playing. He walked over to the record player, shut it off, picked the record up, and calmly snapped it in half, letting the pieces drop to the floor. Without speaking, he turned to the half dozen albums lying on the kitchen table, pulled the first one from its cover, and smashed it on the table's edge. He did the same with the second and the third. He moved slowly, silently, shattering each one. And after the last record had fallen, he shook his head just slightly, and with the shadow of a smile on his face, bent to the floor. He gathered up the pieces, the broken sombras, the shattered payeso, and walked them to the garbage outside. When he returned, he walked over to Espy's mother, still frozen in place with a dish towel in her hand. I didn't want the neighbors to hear, he said as he approached her. He put his hands on her shoulders and looked at her warmly, intently. You're as good as any white woman, Lily. Don't give anyone around here reason to think otherwise. Then he took the towel out of her hand and set it on the counter, closed his arms around her, and Espy, who had tucked herself and her doll away on the kitchen table, watched her mother float there, like a seed from a milkweed pod caught in a child's gentle fist. After dinner, Espy finished her homework at the kitchen table while her mother irons and watches Medical Center on the TV. Dr. Joe Gannon is in love with a patient who has horrible headaches and can't even remember if she's married or not. Espy would rather read her fairy tale book with her mother, but she knows this is her mother's favorite program, so she works quietly and doesn't interrupt. To Ben Namiha, her mother shuts off the TV and scoots her down the hall to her room where she tucks her in with a kiss on the forehead. Dream with the angels. But Espy can't sleep. After lying quietly for what seems like hours, she gets out paper and her chalks, finds the orange, and sets it on the dresser. Then she sits staring at it from her bed. The curtain is open slightly. But there is no moon, and the orange remains a colorless shadow. Espy thinks about night, how it steals color from everything. She looks around her room, her shoes where she left them on the floor, her transistor radio, radio on the nightstand, the long stuffed snake Ben brought for her, coiled around the bedpost. Of course, she knows the colors of all of these things, but night has made them all the same. Espy finds some comfort in that, but also knows it won't make a very interesting drawing. She sets her chalks on the end table and curls up under the sheet. On the bus the next morning, Espy is one of the first ones on. Louis, the bus driver, holds out a wax paper bundle to her as she climbs the steps. Here, take it. What is it, Louis? She asks as his gnarled, honey-colored fist opens and drops the gift into her cupped palm. Louis is the only person she knows besides her mother and herself who came here from somewhere else. She takes a seat behind Louis and then wraps the paper caref carefully. It's dried mango from the Philippines, he says. 
It will make you toasty again after you gulp down your frozen milk. Louis has complained to S.B. repeatedly about the winter's bitter cold and the ache it creates on his knuckles. And, in tur and she, in turn, has complained about the milk truck delivering cartons of frozen milk at lunchtime. S.B. tries to look out her window, but can't see anything. She takes her glove off and presses the side of her hand into the thick frost still covering the glass, leaving a blurred crescent shape. Then she uses her fingernail to complete the circle, sketching out the shape of her orange. It's difficult because she can't decide whether to leave the white as shadow or use the white as the bright. She decides to leave the white as the shadow, which makes a strange sort of reverse orange. The world outside the bus squeezes into it. It reminds Espy of a snow globe. Flakes drift past scotch pines and blue spruce as the bus brushes past. At one point, she sees a small bird in the center. She pulls the piece of mango out of the wax paper and chews on the end of it, contemplating her entire world framed by one small orange. Espy gets off the bus near the convent garden and walks toward the school playground. Yesterday's brief thaw has given way to March's fickle moods, leaving the playground covered with sheets of ice. Children run and slide across the ice, full of Friday enthusiasm. Espy can't help but feel some of it, too. Ben will be home tonight in time to watch Ghost Story and Circle of Fear. She will curl up next to him in her flannel pajamas covered with pink roses, and it will feel good to be just a little bit scared. The orange is still in her plastic book bag, where she left it this morning, and she takes it out, studies it for a minute, then gives it a push down the icy pavement. It hits a bump and wobbles off to the right, coming to a standstill in front of a blue fence post. Its color shines there brilliant and pure against the harsh white of the snow, and the quiet blue of the paint. The orange color glows in a way she knows she can never capture on paper. Espy raises her fingertips slowly to her forehead. Anaranjado, she whispers. The word creeps gently into the forefront of her memory, along with a sadness that no one else will notice the beauty and the brilliance of this perfect, solitary orange. But Espy has seen it, and Espy will remember. She closes her eyes, taking a snapshot of it in her head, and there it magically reverses itself, a blue disc floating on a glowing patch of orange. She holds the image against tightly pressed eyelids, letting go of it only when the school bell rings and she runs to find her place in line.